So I want to talk about uh, cliches in short films because uh, I think we all do it. If you're if you're a filmmaker, if you're an aspiring filmmaker, if you're a writer, you end up uh, writing into cliches, especially earlier uh, in your career, just because it's what everybody does. I'm a big believer that the first five or ten things you make are going to be just chock full of cliches because you got to get the you got to get the poison out before you can start writing the the real stuff. This is the top ten uh, short film cliches as viewed by a guy who works in the biz, uh, film festivals, agents, managers, blah, 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 uh, screenplay reader, screener, all, I've, seen, I've seen everything. And there's sort of an ebb and flow of what the cliches are at the time, the flavor of the week, but these are the ones that I still see every single day, um, short films and student films. So uh, number 10, uh, YouTube's gonna punish me if I say this wrong, so it's the puff puff scene. Um, it used to just be the regular, the regular stuff, you, you know, farmers grow, and now it's everything. Um, there's a time and a place for the puff puff scene, but uh, I've, I see a lot of movies, uh, short films especially, that are just about the puff puff scene, and you, you know, try harder. That's, that's all I'm trying to say about that. I'm not, I'm not too school for cool, I'm just saying try harder. Number nine, endless dialogue. Uh, this is, I think the best way to describe this experience is, uh, you watch a movie and it's really fast talking and there's a lot of dialogue and then the movie ends and you go, oh, nothing happened. Um, yeah, sometimes sometimes writers just fall in love with the dialogue and they forget that you actually have to have a narrative story that takes place, um, especially if you're doing, you know, any kind of movie that you want to be a sample or, you know, something that's going to help your career. Uh, just talking for the sake of talking is not, is not a story uh, necessarily. So, yeah. Number eight, bad special effects or bad visual effects, but more importantly, leaning on them. Um, you know, I, I point to Spielberg, don't show the shark uh, until the last moment, because especially in short films, especially in student films, the budgets are so low, the special effects or the visual effects or the, the creatures, the monsters, whatever, they're going to look bad. Um, the best way to get around that is just to shoot around it. But the second you show whatever your bad quality thing is, the jig is up, so just just don't show it. Just just avoid it at all costs because it's gonna look bad. Hopefully the story is strong enough that people can forgive it. But yeah, if you show the monster in the first ten seconds, people are gonna click away on the on the eleventh. So moving on, uh, number seven, confusing the mundane with the interesting. A movie about nothing, uh, mumblecore, which I will get back to in a second. Improvised dialogue. You know, it's, it's really cool now to because of Kirby enthusiasm to have an entire movie that's improvised. Um, or just a day in the life, a day in the life story. Just because it's interesting to you, you got to make sure you test it and make sure it's interesting to other people because a lot of things in life are mundane and the, the solution to figure out if it's mundane is to pitch it to people and if they glaze over, if they check their phone in the middle of the pitch, uh, you blew it. So um, make sure what you're doing is interesting and if it's actually mundane, you got to figure out a way using tricks or something to make it interesting because, uh, you know, even mumblecore, you see the you see these filmmakers that came up in sort of mumblecore. That's where I came up. Uh, now they're all big Hollywood bigwigs, but they're not doing mumblecore. They're doing regular movies because at a certain point, mumblecore doesn't offer anything because you still have to have you know dialogue and directing and action and things happening. So, yeah. Uh, number six, fancy camera stuff. I'm talking about super shallow depth of field with you know sparkly bouquet in the background. I'm talking about uh, haze. Haze seems to be a really common one lately. It's just everywhere. Every scene has tons and tons of smoky haze. Uh, what else? Ne uh, neon lights are really cool now. Um, long long shots, complicated camera shots, um, oneers, one long takes, all that kind of stuff. Um, if your movie is four minutes long and it's a three and a half minute long one take. Uh, you probably have a pacing problem because you it's just unlikely you nailed it unless you're unless you've mastered this and you're just now applying it to your film so uh, fancy camera stuff on a short film probably not worth your while definitely not worth time on set and then in post uh, you're probably gonna have to dice it up and so whatever all that fancy stuff is gonna get lost in the edit anyway so moving on uh, number five and YouTube will definitely punish me if I say this wrong persons expiring so either the story is about a person expiring or persons expiring, or a major critical plot point is a person expiring or persons expiring. Uh, yeah, it's a well you can go to because it's it's free emotion, but it is kind of a crutch, like because you know persons expiring equals sad emotions. Uh, 
dig deeper. You can get those sad emotions if the plan was trying to elicit an emotion. There's much simpler, uh, more nuanced ways to do it than just showing expiring. Um, it's kind of a cheat. So moving on. Uh, number four, and YouTube will definitely punish me for saying this wrong, doing it scenes. Uh, nuding up, dropping clothes, that kind of stuff. I guess you can argue for, you know, like high-end TV and definitely movies, especially because they'll go out to theaters or they'll get distribution and they'll make money. That's when that's when the losing the clothes thing maybe could make sense as long as it works with the story. For short films, I find it kind of icky. And honestly, you know, it's, it's one thing to have uh, an actor or an actress, let's be honest, uh, drop the clothes for a short film. It's another thing for them to do a student film because that student film probably is going to have to end up you know, it might end up in a in a semester of editing. So instead of instead of just having the editor and the director seeing it, you might have a whole class having to watch that for an entire semester. And did the actor or actress know that going in? Um, you know, it's very uncomfortable, and it's not worth it. Usually, you can you can get the same stuff with the clothes still on. Honestly, uh, sometimes it works better that way because again, don't show the shark. Moving on, uh, number three, the getting ready sequence. Uh, sometimes it's cooking, sometimes it's on the way. I feel like right now it's like riding the, the train somewhere or walking somewhere. Uh, the one that drives me nuts is the brushing the teeth in the mirror or doing the makeup in the mirror. Um, yeah, if the beat is they get ready, that's not worth an entire scene or sequence. It's not, it's mundane. I think the only reason that would be worthwhile at all is if it's a tooth brushing sequence and the person doesn't brush their teeth. Like they, this is the first time they've ever done it. That might actually be interesting. Uh, other than that, it's just, it's mundane, but it's also like, sure, mirrors are fun, but uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help anything. It's, it's very boring and it doesn't advance the plot. It kills the, it kills the pacing. So, uh, number two, record scratch. How did I get here? Uh, just don't do it. Yeah. So, uh, I know a lot of people have a real problem with like narration, like a narrator talking. Uh, yeah, the one that the one that drives me nuts because I can I can kind of forgive a narrator depending on what the movie is. But if somebody goes, "Oh man, how did I get here?" Cut to three weeks ago. Uh, why why wouldn't you just start there then? So so before I get to number one, I want to talk about some honorable mentions. So feel free to guess what number one is in the comments. I'm pretty sure you'll get it right. Uh, some honorable mentions. Bad sound. The reason it doesn't get a number is because a bad sound is a deal breaker. If the sound sucks, people will turn it off, you're boned, film festivals will say no, people will stop watching. The sound has to be good. Yeah. Uh, another honorable mention, bad acting or bad actors. Uh, I don't blame the actors. You know, it's a short film uh, or it's a student film, so there's very low resources. It's probably not much money involved um, and there's low experience level. So it could be the director didn't get the performances out of the actors. It could be the director wasn't even paying attention. It could be you, you just got your friends off the street. Yeah, I, I don't begrudge the actors, but yeah, uh, the thing about bad acting is if, as long as the story's good, as long as the you know the, the movie's compelling, you can sort of shoot around or cut around the bad acting and kind of save it. So I'm not, I'm not, it's distractingly bad acting is not usually a deal breaker, so. And the last honorable mention is incomprehensible. So unless you're doing an art film, unless you're doing uh, an abstract film for art's sake, uh, you're trying to tell a story. You're trying to have a narrative. You're trying to communicate something to the audience. That means things have to be clear. Things have to be simple. I very much look into the edit. To, instead of adding things in the edit, taking things out, simplifying, clarifying, usually taking major things out that would derail the uh, what is trying to be accomplished, which is the narrative and the emotional experience. So simple is better. If it's incomprehensible, um, people will argue that the incomprehensible films are great. Yeah, okay, but how many people, how many, like how many TV shows get made that are completely incomprehensible? So, and, and that's honorable mentions. So here we go, number one. Let's see if you got it right. Uh, it's the bang bang shoot shoots and the slice slice poke pokes because YouTube will punish me. Um, yeah, it's, it's a crutch. It's a narrative crutch. It's a MacGuffin. It's uh, it's usually when I see that when I come onto a short film set or a student set, I get really uncomfortable because it means they probably didn't do the time they needed to in writing the story and making sure the the story, the narrative, which is what's most important, actually works. And instead, they're going to play with toys. Um, toys are fun, 
But for the sake of a short film, you're trying to elicit emotion and story and an experience. And if you bring a bang, bang, shoot, shoot, or slice, slice, poke, poke, it becomes about that. Uh, weirdly enough, um, my film school, because the uh, production insurance was through the school, they had all these rules. And one of the rules was you couldn't have any of that stuff. Um, and if you got caught with it, you lost your insurance and therefore your production got shut down. So, yeah, I, I ain't mad at that, honestly. Just it's. It's not worth it, you know. There's always going to be cop shows. There's always going to be, you know, sandals and the other word shows, uh, and and movies. But for the sake of your short film, you know, telling a story is much more important than actually like having a good time doing this all day. So, uh, yeah, what do you guys think? What which ones did I miss? Uh, have you seen a bunch of cliches that just drive you crazy, and I completely blew past them? Uh, yeah, let me know. Like, share, subscribe. Catch you next time.